Good morning, Wallenstein. My name is Mark Hockley, and it's a privilege to be with you and to open God's Word with you this morning. I wish that we could be um, together in person. For those of you who don't know me, I grew up at Wallenstein, and so uh, it's always a treat to come back to Wallenstein. Many of you are faithful brothers and sisters who poured into my life directly or indirectly and helped to foster my love of Christ, and for that I will always be thankful to you, and it will always, uh, Wallenstein will always hold a special place in my heart and always feel like home. Today we are continuing your series, Living Hope. We are looking today at Hope Makes Heat from Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15. So you can turn there, uh, let's pray, and then we'll dig into God's word together. God, you are so good. And Lord, we thank you for that. God, I thank you that you are love, God, and that you are peace and that you are so many amazing things. God, I pray that you would be with us today. I pray that you would help to open our minds and open our hearts, God, to the things that you uh, want to show us. Lord, I pray that we would not just be hearers of the word, but that we would be doers of the word. God, I pray that you would speak through me. Lord, you know that if it's just my words that we're wasting our time, God, we, we, we need to hear from you. I pray that I would be able to properly convey the things that you have taught me and challenged me with and encouraged me with through this text, and that I would be able to convey uh, those same truths to your saints, and that we would all together be challenged and encouraged in Christ. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. So, uh, let's read Titus chapter 2, 11 through 15 together. Titus chapter 2. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation to all people, instructing us to deny godliness and worldly desires, and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age. Looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus who gave himself for us to redeem from us a lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, eager for good deeds. These things speak and exhort, rebuke with all authority. No one is to disregard you. And this is a wonderful little package of verses that I was given in. In these five verses, if you didn't notice, um, we have the gospel so succinctly um, demonstrated. And so I just want to quickly unpack that for you because we're going to look at um, a couple of different things. I'll go through the outline in a second, but we're going to see um, some big some big words. We're going to see justification, sanctification, and glorification in these things. And if you don't like big words, don't worry. I'm not going to leave you hanging. Don't, don't shut it off. Don't tune us out. Um, but uh, I hope that today you'll be encouraged by those things as we see the gospel demonstrated in these verses and how it applies to the living hope uh, that we're looking at in this series. So if you look at verse 11, it says, for the grace of God has appeared. And now that's when he's talking about that, he's not talking about the general grace of God. He's actually talking about grace incarnate, right? Jesus Christ has appeared, bringing to salvation to all people. So we see salvation, right? We see justification. And then next it says, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age. And here we can see sanctification. We can see that, yes, we've been saved, but God's desire is for us to grow into more into the likeness of Christ. And then we, moving on, we see looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that is the living hope, the blessed hope that we are talking about today, right? Glorification when Christ returns and we get to be with him. And so these are beautiful things. So I'm going to give you the outline for today. Uh, you can follow along or provided that um, PowerPoint for you if you want to follow along with um, these here today. So first we're going to look at justification and under justification what we're going to sort of describe it as is being saved from the penalty of sin. 
That's what justification is. And then we've got salvation from the power of sin, and that is sanctification. That's growing in the likeness of God. We're, we're being actively saved from the power of sin, even though we were saved from the penalty of sin and justification. And then for salvation from the presence of sin, that is glorification, right? One day when we are with God, we are going to be free from the presence of sin. And that is going to be a beautiful, beautiful thing. And then finally today, we're going to talk about hope and the gospel. And we're going to talk about how each of these um, different parts of the gospel connect to hope and how hope connects to them and how hope makes that heat and so we're, that's where we're going to go this morning. See, because the gospel is at the center of the living hope that we have as Christians. Our understanding of eternity and our longing for eternity is rooted in our understanding of the gospel right now here in the present. Let me show you what I mean. So first we can look at justification. We can look at being saved from the penalty of sin, right? We know that Jesus is coming back, but Jesus coming back is only good news for those who are saved from the penalty of sin. It's only good news for those who are saved from the penalty of sin. And secondly, if we think about sanctification, if we think about growing in the likeness of Christ and being saved from the power of sin, I want you to consider this. If there's minimal sanctification going on in your life right now, like if you're not experiencing the Holy Spirit saving you from the power of sin and giving you these glimpses of eternity right now as you walk with God and obey God and follow God in your everyday life, then you're not going to be excited about Jesus returning. You're not going to be excited about eternity. But if you are experiencing the power of the Holy Spirit and what it's like to walk in obedience with God and to be with him and experience him and have him change you, then you're going to be excited for eternity because you're already getting those glimpses of it as you spend time with God, getting to know him more and experience um, his transforming power in your life. So I think it's a really good test for you just to be really honest with yourself about how excited you are for eternity and it's really an ex excellent litmus test regarding your sanctification you can see you can just sort of test that and see where you're at i watched an interview with one of the top uh, leaders from the underground church movement in the middle east and it was a powerful interview as he talked about how the penalty for baptizing somebody um, is execution and there's no trial there's no jury, you have no rights. And yet in the midst of that climate, the mosques are emptying and the church is exploding. But one of the things that stood out to me as he talked was how excited he was for eternity, how his eyes were fixed on eternity. Because one of the questions that the interviewer asked her, him essentially was this. Um, she said to him, how do you deal with the understanding that as you share the gospel with people, you are essentially loving them to your death, to their death. How do you deal with that? That you're essentially loving them to their death, knowing that if they accept Christ, there's a good chance that jail or death is the path for them. And his, in, his answer was just very interesting. He said, Jenny, death is merely just the gateway to life. Do I want to die? Of course not. Nobody wants to die. But we understand that death is merely the gateway to life with God. His eyes were so fixed on Christ, they were so fixed on eternity because he was walking with God and experiencing God. And he shared some of these miraculous things that God is doing over there that just like blow our minds and there's things that we could never even dream of that are happening there right now. And so because they're walking with God and experiencing him, they have a proper understanding and their eyes are fixed on the proper place so that they can be excited about eternity and not fear death. And then if we consider salvation from the presence of sin, if we consider glorification, right? It's the salvation from the penalty of sin and salvation from the power of sin that allows us to look forward to being in the presence of our creator without the presence of sin. 
And so you can see how all of these elements of the gospel are absolutely essential to the hope that we're going to be talking about. So that's why we're going to spend some time talking about each of these elements, and then we're going to go and we're going to discuss what that looks like and how they connect to this hope that we're discussing. So first we're going to look at justification, which we've said is saved from the penalty of sin, being saved from the penalty of sin. And now when you hear justification, justification, it's a legal term. And it means to declare righteous or to declare someone not guilty. Or to de declare judicially that, one, that someone is in harmony with the law, right? Get the idea of a courtroom. But here's the problem. We know we're not righteous. We are not in harmony with God's law. We all have sinned. We've all fallen short of God's perfection. We are spiritually dead. And we got to remember that. The, God, the, the Bible doesn't say we're spiritually meh. The Bible doesn't say we're spiritually mediocre. The Bible doesn't say we're spiritually in trouble. The Bible says that we, apart from God, are spiritually dead. And there's this gap between us and God that cannot be traversed by any human. Right? So that's where in steps Jesus, right? Fully God, fully man, like us in every way and yet perfect, without sin. There's no gap for him and God. And so when the judge looks at him, he sees no wrongs. And yet when the judge looks at me, he sees a list as far as the eye can see. Right? So the judge reads that list and he reads the verdict then and says guilty. Right? The punishment, death, eternal separation from God because God can't be around sin. And it's into that big mess that Jesus steps in, right? And he takes my place. He allowed himself to be put on the cross. And the sin of the world, including my sin, is placed on him. And he died in my place. And he died in your place. And he took the punishment for my sin and for your sin. Right? But three days later, he comes back to life. And in coming back to life, he demonstrates he's got the power over sin and the power over death. Right? That to those who believe in him, to those who, who of us would say, yeah, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sin. And I need you desperately because I want to be with God. Right? To those who call on his name, he gives new life. John Calvin put justification this way. He said, man is not made righteous in justification, but is accepted as righteous, perfect, not on the account of his own righteousness, his own perfection, but on the account of the righteousness of Christ located outside of man. It's outside of Christ. There's nothing that we can do, right? We'll sum it up like this. When we are justified, the judge looks at us and he doesn't see our sin, but instead he sees the righteousness of Christ, right? You can picture the Bible talks about us being like clothed in the righteousness of Christ, or it's almost like in the courtroom, Jesus almost, like, it's almost like he like stands in front. And now when the judge looks at us, he no longer sees our sin, but instead he sees the perfection of Jesus, the one who took our place, the one who took our punishment, right? And this is the heart of the gospel that we have been justified as Christians, declared not guilty, not because of anything we have done. It was all because of the righteousness, because of the perfection of Christ. Remember Ephesians chapter two, for by grace you have been saved through faith, right? And this is not from yourselves, not from works, so that no one can boast. It's literally impossible for us to make ourselves righteous before God. We were dead. You gotta remember that we were dead. And that's why the gospel is such good news. It's not like we were close to the line and Jesus just dragged us over a little bit. We were so far from the line that you can't even see it. And it was all because of Jesus that we get brought into the presence of God. Right? That's why the gospel is such good news because there was, where there was no hope, God provided hope. And what's so beautiful about this is some of you might be saying right now, if God only knew what I have done, if God only knew blank, you can insert your blank, he wouldn't possibly forgive me. He wouldn't possibly want me. And what's so beautiful about the gospel is that God knows everything about you. And he still has a desire for you to come to him. He still has a desire for you to be with him. And he will love you and he will forgive you. And he will be your savior and your king. 
God has a desire to be with you every step of the way. And we're gonna see that. We can see that so clearly in salvation. Jesus sent, um, God sent his son Jesus to come so that we could be safe, so that we could be with God. But we're also gonna see that he doesn't just leave us hanging, right? But he has a desire to be with us in sanctification because he wants what's best for us. And then in glorification, when he comes back, he has a desire to be with us. What an amazing thought, right? That the creator of the universe would have a desire to be with me, to be with you. So justification, we said, is saved from the penalty of sin. Sanctification is being saved from the power of sin. And so I'm going to put a chart up. And uh, I'm not, we're not going to read it all. I just want you to take a peek at it. You can take a screenshot, whatever you want to do with it. And it just shows the difference between justification and sanctification. But we can, we can sort of sum it up like this. Justification is the act by which God gets us out of sin legally. And sanctification is the process by which God gets us out of sin actually. And if you remember from our text in Titus 2.12, what did it ask us to do? What is God's desire for us? It says, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and in a godly manner in the present age. So how do I become sanctified? Uh, well, there's six things. When I originally started this, I had a big list and lots to say, and for sake of time, we're not doing it. I'm just going to read it to you quickly here. Um, these, these things, and I hope that you will use them as a springboard um, in your own life. You might know them in your head, like a lot of these aren't going to be a surprise to you, um, but I'd encourage you just to check whether you're actually doing them, I and mean, to what level, how effective are they? How serious are you about these things in your life? And the first one is this, uh, the Holy Spirit, right? If we want to be sanctified, if we want to grow in the likeness of God, if we want to be made more like Jesus and less like our sinful selves, then we need the Holy Spirit, right? Just as you can't be freed from the penalty of sin you, on your own, like you can't do that on your own. We just talked about that. You can't be freed from the power of sin on your own. And yet so often we're like, hallelujah, praise Jesus. I needed him desperately to save me from the penalty of sin, but I got this for the power of sin. And the reality is it's not true. And so often I can act um, like I can do it on my own. The second one is the Bible, right? You got to be in God's word, right? It's where you're going to know him and where you're also going to learn his instructions for you. Third one's prayer, right? Praying and asking God to change you. And also prayer for other believers in their spiritual lives. We see this in the Bible all the time with the apostle Paul, right? He says, I praise God for you about this. I keep you in my prayers. I thank God for you about this, but I'm going to pray for you for A, B, C, and D that you would grow more. Do you pray for each other, church? Do you pray for each other, not just for when things are going bad, but do you pray for each other spiritually that they, people would grow and they would increase in their knowledge of God? Do you pray for each other like that? Number four, allow God to work, right? We can move so slow in this process because we drag our feet. We can move so slow. Don't do it. That's why we, we grow so slowly sometimes. Number five, go to war against sin. Sometimes we treat sin as an inconvenience, a minor inconvenience or something that's kind of annoying. Um, and we need to go to war, right? We need to destroy it, fumigate it, flamethrower, whatever we got to do, got to destroy it, get rid of it. And the last one is sanctified in community. You were not meant to do this alone. And in our individualistic culture, so many times, um, we, try to, we try to walk this path on our own and we don't want to let anybody else in. We don't want to bear any of our secrets, any of our struggles. And yet that is not how God designed the body. That's not how God designed the church. We were meant to be sanctified in community together. And so what does sanctification look like? I'm going to give you a little list and I hope um, you recognize things on this list that you're like, yeah, God's doing this sort of stuff in my life because the goal of this list is not for you to go, well i feel bad about this and i failed at that, that the, that's not the goal the goal is that there would be things on this list that would encourage you and say yeah god has been doing that in my life and then there would be other things where you're like yeah i recognize god needs to work on me in that or i i can see something that god wants to do in my life or maybe there's something the holy spirit prompting you to do even though you don't want to do it 
Um, but what, is, what are some things that happen when you're being sanctified? Here's the first one, a love of conviction and a love of repentance. Christian, do you love conviction? Do you love repentance? Or do you get your, get your defenses up every time one of your friends points something out, or maybe something's pointed out in a sermon or God's word? or a book, do you, get, do you get your defenses up and figure out all the re reasons why you shouldn't really be convicted by it? Or do you embrace it and you love it because you know you're being made more like Christ? Do you love it? Because see, conviction and repentance are a catalyst for growth. They should be a natural part of your life. They should be a natural part of your life. Here's the second thing, a love of people that you wouldn't be naturally inclined to love. And this is true both for Christians and non-Christians. I'm gonna give you an example as Christians, right? For Christians, are there people right now in your church family that you can point to being really honest and say, you know what? If we weren't Christians, I probably wouldn't have this love, this affection for them. Like, do you only hang out with the people at church that you would hang out with anyways? Or are there people in the church where you're like, yeah, we look at it and we're like, we don't have the same interests. We don't have the same hobbies. Most of the time I clash with personalities like you. And yet we have this brotherly and sisterly affection in Christ because we're part of the body of Christ together. Can you see people in your church like that? That's a demonstration that God is changing you that you are growing to be more like Christ because we can look around and it's fairly obvious to say that is not a normal thing. So if that's you, be encouraged. Another thing that we can look at is the love of things that you never used to love, right? For some of you, you're like, man, I am so out on reading. I do not like reading. Big words, I'm out. Confusing things, I'm out. And yet you're like, that's kind of describes the Bible. It's got big words. It's got lots of confusing things, got things that I don't understand. I'm out on reading my Bible. Christian, I would encourage you to pray and ask God to give you a love of reading his word, right? Because you're not going to grow. You're, you're not going to get to know him more um, without using the primary method by which he's given you to get to know you more. And you've got the creator of the universe who wants to know you. And here's the last one. This is a personal example um, that I can give from a few years ago. You know, in the Bible where Paul says, I'm in tears um, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ. And I came across that passage and um, I recognized in myself that that's not me, right? I'm kind of straight line like this. I, I'm not very emotional. Um, I laugh with my wife. I'm really quite boring. She's fun. I am not. Um, and so this isn't me. And yet when I saw that, I prayed and I said, God, I recognize that that's not me. I was convicted by it. God, help me, help this to be me. And lo and behold, God answers prayer. And often now when I pray, um, I can be in tears. And sometimes it's awkward and sometimes it's weird um, because it's not, it's not me. It's not something that I normally experience. And yet it's so cool and so special to me every time it happens because I know that it's the answer prayer from God because it's outside of my personality and who that I am. And yet God is changing me and that is beautiful. And then glorification, right? Glorification saved from the presence of sin. Saved from the presence of sin. This is what we have to look forward to as Christians. Revelation 21, one to four. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. And then I heard a loud voice from the throne. Look, God's dwelling is with humanity and he will live with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will be no more because the previous things have passed away. This is what we have to look forward to, Christians. We look forward to being with God. That is the hope 
that we're going to be talking about, that we get to be with God without any sin. Right? We're saved from the presence of sin and totally in the presence of God. And so let's switch gears and let's talk. What is hope? What is hope according to the Bible? See, because there's a difference between how we use hope and how the Bible uses it. Hope in our modern usage can basically be translated like I'd like that to happen. If you go and ask a lot of people, hey, are you going to heaven? A lot of people are going to say, I hope so. Right? There's no assurance. Or if, you, if you're talking with your husband or wife, whoever, and you're like, do you think the chef at this restaurant is going to get my steak just right? You say, I sure hope so. I paid a lot of money for that steak. Right? But in the Bible, the word that gets translated, hope, gives the idea of confidence and security. There's no association with doubt or uncertainty. We really use them completely differently. And a lot of the time, unknowingly, we can import our idea of hope, how we use hope, into our Bible reading. Let me give you an example. Hebrews 11, chapter 1, says this. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. In plain English, a lot of us can read this verse like, now faith is being sure of what we hope will happen and convinced of what we do not see. But really, this verse should read like this. It should read, now faith is being sure of what we already have absolute confidence in and certain of what we do not see. It's a whole other sermon talking about the dynamic between faith and hope. And what's our hope rooted in? Why can we be, why, why should we be confident? It's because it's rooted in the character of who God is. This is why we have a sure hope, right? That God is unchanging, right? That God is love. And then you just put those two characteristics together and now you've got God is unchanging love. And you think about all the other attributes and how they all um, intersect and intertwine together. That is what makes it so um, wonderful. Let me give you an example. Um, I found this when I was doing some research um, that John Piper gave. I found it very helpful, and I hope, see what I did there? I'm confident that you will too. In the paragraph um, before this, what I'm going to read to you, he talks about the difference between mathematical and logical certainty, right? The idea that like 2 plus 2 equals 4, and we can be absolutely certain about that. Uh, but what he's going to talk about here is moral certainty and how it has a role to play. It's not entirely... Um, it's, but it, it has a role to play in our understanding of the biblical hope. He says, let me illustrate. I have a strong moral certainty that Noel and I are going to stay married to each other as long as we live. This is not based on mathematical laws or merely logical syllogisms. It's based on the character of our wills and the promises of God, which are just expressions of the character of his will. We have almost 20 years of evidence about the nature and commitment of our wills and the graciousness of God's will. When we speak of our future, we do not speak in terms of ordinary hope. We don't say, for example, we hope that we won't get divorced. We speak in terms of confidence and certainty because the character of a God-centered will is like iron. But of course, we could be wrong, couldn't we? Yes, and all the communists in the world may convert to Christianity this afternoon. And it may be that not a single deceptive word will creep into any advertisement for the next five years. And that every pornographic publisher may go out of business by year's end because men will gain mastery over their lustful desires. All these things are mathematically and logically possible. There's no mathematical or logical certainty that they won't happen. Why then do we have such strong confidence that they will not happen? Because we know something about the human will. There's a kind of certainty that comes from knowing the character of a man or a group of men or a wife. It is not infallible, but it is secure and confident. It lets you sleep at night. It carries you over rough times, and eventually you can, it can see you right through the grave. Biblical hope is not a mere desire for something good to happen. It is a confident expression and desire for something good in the future. Biblical hope has moral certainty in it. When the word says hope in God, it does not mean cross your fingers. It means to use the words of William Carey, expect great things from God. And so I just want you to see that there, this connection between the character of who God is and the certainty of our hope, right? It's because of what we know about God that we can be so confident in our hope. 
And it goes from, I just hope this will happen to, I have confidence that this will happen. I have confidence in who God is. I have confidence that he will return. Right? And so as we talk about this in this last section, I want you to hear, when, you, when I say hope, I want you to hear confidence in God because of who he is. And you can also hear hope in that one day when he comes again. That's the kind of hope that I want you to think about. So first, let's look at hope and salvation. Hope and salvation, we talked about this, and we're going to look at it again. So the, in the character of God, it's rooted in the character of God. Right? Jesus, when we, when we are saved, we've experienced the love that Jesus has for us. Right? And we experience that when we're saved. And by experiencing it, it both fuels our certainty that the return of Christ is going to be glorious. And it fuels our desire for that to happen because we've already experienced it in salvation. And the other thing that hope and salvation does is it sort of like starts these bookends between salvation and glorification, right? Because we hope, we have this confidence in what Jesus did for us. Um, and then there's also hope in what he's going to do for us because of what we've already experienced. There's also hope in sanctification. If you look at um, verse 14 for a second, it, it talks about how we are to be zealous for good deeds. And I just want to remind us of this fact that good works are a product of salvation. They're not the means of salvation, right? And the Bible makes that abundantly clear. Good works are a product of salvation. They are not the means of salvation. If you go back just a few to verse 12, where we looked at a couple times, like look at what it's calling us to, to deny ungodliness and worldly desires. That's hard enough and live sensibly, righteously, and godly in the present age. With everything going on around, this is how God calls us to live. That's hard, right? Life is hard. So how do we do them? Here's some things that hope helps us do as we try, as we um, are sanctified. Here's some things that hope will help you do. First, let's look at a couple of things that are rooted in the in the character of God. The first one is this, it's confidence in the justice of God. And I want you to specifically think about the link between justice and forgiveness, because this is something that um, being a pastor, I've noticed a lot of people struggle with, right? Is forgiveness. So I just want you to think about this, right? There's two paths of things that can happen when somebody wrongs you. Either that wrong is going to be covered by the blood of Jesus, just like all your wrongs have been covered by the blood of Jesus, if that person is a believer, or one day God calls them and they become a believer. Or the other option is that they are going to be dealt with by a just God. Do you know what that means? It means that either way, you don't need to worry. You can let it go. You don't need to hold that grudge, you don't need to hold that pain. You can posture your heart into a state of forgiveness, being ready and willing to forgive. Here's the second one. We can also have confidence in both the imminence and the transcendence of God. So let's flash that out. God has a desire to be with you, right? He is an imminent God. He doesn't just hang up out in heaven and he, he has no desire to be with you. He doesn't care about what's going on. He desires to be with you. And I know for some of you, the stuff that you're going through right now, it just, you're just like, Mark, it feels like God is so far away. And brothers and sisters, I want you to remember this truth that he is with you. There's a God who cares about you, right? We think about this all the time at Christmas. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And yet we can see how it also is so encouraging that God is also transcendent, right? That he is so much bigger, that he is so much greater than anything in our world. And so some of the problems that you're facing today, like some of you are facing really just like legit hard problems. And it, it can feel like God just can't handle them. Right? Or it just feels like he's far away, whatever, wherever you're at. And it's just this room. I want you to remember that God is bigger and that God is greater. Here's another thing that hope can do. 
Uh, one of the things that we know with hope and we think about eternity, we think about Christ returning, is that we already know the ending. And this in itself brings us confidence. So we have confidence in who God is. Um, but we also have confidence because we know the ending. Uh, my daughter Marlo is three. And she is very sweet and very sensitive. And um, she, like most three-year-olds, she likes watching Paw Patrol. And so sometimes when she's watching Paw Patrol, she'll sit there and she'll start to get scared or cry, even though she's seen the episode at least five times. And sometimes I have to come over to her and I have to remind her that, Marlo, do you remember how this ends? Right? The pups win, right? The pups fix the problem, right? Because that's what happens in Paw Patrol. The pups always fix the problem. The pups always save the day. That's what happens in Paw Patrol. And so even though she knows the ending, she still gets scared. And sometimes as adults, we can think about this as a little bit silly. But we so often do this in our faith. Let me give you an example. You can answer these questions along with me. Uh, does the Bible call you to tell others of the gospel? Yes. Do you think God commands you to tell others about the gospel? Yes. Do you think it pleases God when you tell others of the gospel? Yes. Do you actively and consistently tell others the gospel? For a lot of us, right, the answer is no, not really. For a lot of us, it's because of fear, right? We know the ending. We know that Christ is gonna return. We know that he is going to reign. We know that Satan will be bound. And yet we fear. We don't do what God's called us to do. We can do the same thing. Psalm 42, verse 5. Um, you can turn there if you want. Psalm 42, verse 5. I've heard this described as a gut-wrenching psalm. Because it, it, in this psalm, David is in a struggle with himself he's in a struggle like against himself like you can see this push pull in his soul in this this psalm this verse right here is just a little window into his soul so i want you to see what it says it says why are you cast down O my soul and why are you in turmoil within me hope in god for i shall again praise him my salvation in my god One of the keys to being made more into the image of God is to hope in God. And one of the beautiful things about the Psalms is they so accurately show the struggle of the Christian life, right? Hoping in God, we can be really honest about this. Hoping in God is not a natural thing for us, right? Even as people who have been saved from the penalty of sin, right? We, as believers, we don't naturally incline our hearts most of the time to hope in God. Our default when we are cast down, when there is turmoil around us, is not to hope in God. And so we must consistently preach this to ourselves. Preach that three-word sermon, hope in God. Preach it to yourself over and over and over again. It's good for your soul. And the other thing that really struck me as I was researching and I came across that art article um, from Piper and I mean, it turned out to be a gold mine because there was another thing that he said in there that um, I just found, I recognized to be absolutely true. And it was this, it was the idea of an emotional reservoir of hope. Let me show you what I mean. Here's three examples that he gave. Here's the first one. He says, if I am put down, I look to the emotional reservoir of hope for the strength to return good for evil. Without hope, I have no power to absorb the wrong and walk in love, and I sink into self-pity or self-justification. Number two, if I experience a setback in my planning, I get sick, or things don't go the way I hoped at a board meeting, for example, I look to the emotional reservoir of hope for strength to keep me going and not give up. And here's the third one. If I face the temptation to be dishonest, to steal or to lie or to lust, I look to the emotional reservoir of hope for the strength to hold fast 
to the way of righteousness, to deny myself some brief, unsatisfying pleasure. And as I read those, I just identified those in myself. I could see both the times where they was absent in my life and also when there was that presence in my life, as he described it, this reservoir of hope that I had to draw on when I faced hard times. So I'd encourage you to do the same, right? That reservoir of hope, building up hope in who God is, knowing who God is, experiencing God to be faithful, and knowing that not only is he sitting on the throne right now, but he's coming back for you and for me as Christians. And here's the last thing. Hope in Jesus' return trains us and motivates us as Christians to live faithful and obedient lives. I'll say that one more time. Hope in Jesus return trains us and motivates us as Christians to live faithful and obedient lives. We come to hope and glorification. Hope in the future is God himself. I can't describe it to you any differently and I hope you get it. God himself is the center of the gospel and he's the center of our hope. Right? It's because God is loving. It's because God is just. It's because God is holy. It's because God is transcendent. It's because God is imminent. It's because God is omniscient. It's because God is pure actuality, because he is a deity, because he is so many things that we look forward to him returning. If he was not perfect, it wouldn't be good news. If God wasn't a good God, it would not be good news. But our hope is in that God is so, so good that we could be with him forever. The center of this is God. It's not that you're saved from hell, it's that you're with God. And as we hope in glorification, we think about 1 John 3, 2. It says, dear friends, we are God's children now and what we will be has not yet been revealed. We know that when he appears, we will be made like him because we will see him as he is. See Christians, one day we are going to stand before God and it's gonna be the most mind boggling and amazing experience of your life as a Christian, because see, one day you're going to see God as he is, right? Not veiled, not, Okay, I'm gonna show you like this little glimpse of my back, but you're gonna wish that you're dead because your body can't physically handle seeing me. No, one day we're gonna look into the face of our creator, right? The one who loves us, our savior, our king. That is the hope that we have in glorification, that we will be with God himself forever. It's all about God. That is our hope. That's where the heat comes from. And I'm going to close with this. I wrote this last one down. It says that hope is a church thing. I know at Wallenstein, your desire uh, is to be a gospel-centered church. And we can see if you've been paying attention in Titus, if you flip through it quickly, you can see this. Um, it's almost like this little pattern of what it looks like to be a gospel-centered church. Right? It says, this is how the elders should be. This is how the congregation should live. And then we come to our passage, right? This is how we should hope. This is why we should hope. So what I want to leave you this is this, that you are not just called to hope in God, in this living hope, the God who is hope. You're not just called to do that individually, but you're called to do that collectively as a body, both as the big C church and also the local church. We are called to do this together. And so if you see someone that's down and they lost confidence in God, they've lost focus on him and it happens to all of us, right? Don't call the pastor, don't form a committee. You as a church go and preach that three word sermon to them, hope in God. Remind them that their hope is rooted in the confidence of who God is and that they've experienced him in salvation 
right? Being freed from the penalty of sin. And they've experienced him and being freed from the power of sin in their life and remind them, fix their eyes on the idea that one day we are all going to be with him free from the presence of sin. What a glorious day that will be. And that is the hope that makes heat. See